<laughs> Good morning, church family. So glad to have you here. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be down at Front Street Campus today, but your campus pastor, Pastor Ron, got a head cold. His um, head is throbbing. He would have been here if we hadn't told him no. Uh, that guy is a hard worker, makes no excuses. You are blessed to have Pastor Ron here, I hope you know. Um, so we're a team here. So I'm stepping in here, uh, Front Street Campus. I, I love you guys. I'm joining you virtually through some wires um, and, and internet. Um, but uh, yesterday, as you saw pictures, we had that work party down at the new campus. Is God good? Oh, man, God is good. He is so good. Uh, the provision of this new facility, the, the turnout we had yesterday of, of men and women just using their skills to get this facility ready. We would love to open it by Easter. We would love to use that new baptistry and see lives changed because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Um, man, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little different preaching day because I'm a little, um, I'm not sick, don't worry, but I am a little convicted. Some of you got my email. I was able to go out with a few friends this past week to Asbury, Kentucky. Um, anyone heard about what's going on out there? So I, I did a radio interview this week, and if you want to hear that and you didn't get the email from me, just message me. I'll send you the link because I walked through what it was like to experience that. And I'm I'm not big on experience. I believe in truth, and you, and you run experience through the grid of truth. Experience can be deceiving. But I will tell you, there is a rich history in our country of awakenings or movements of God that, God that we call revival. Um, in the early 1700s, it happened for decades, led to the American Revolution, and the motto in our nation was, no king but King Jesus. 15% um, of New England became followers of Jesus during that period. Um, in the 1800s, there was another huge Great Awakening. In the early 1900s, there was another one. We are overdue. It's been over 100 years. Is what's happening in Kentucky the next Great Awakening? No idea, but something's going on. Two Wednesdays ago in chapel, a speaker just talked about the love of God at Asbury University and how we're so bad at receiving his love and giving his love. And there were some students so deeply convicted by that, they wouldn't leave chapel as rebellious students. Um, and they just felt like they had to get right with God. And they began to pray, they began to read scripture, they began to sing, and they began to confess. Two hours later, there were 200 students in that room. A week later, when we got there, there were 1,500 with a line 100 yards long outside. When we left that evening, there were, the line had doubled in size. And by last night, there were four buildings that were filled with people on that campus. And the entire lawn is full. Asbury is overwhelmed with people. People are coming from around the country and the world. There is an awakening now that's happening at other universities and colleges, from Cedarville to Lee and others. What is God up to? I have no idea. I just know that there's nothing like being in the presence of people that are fully surrendered to Jesus and they're hungry. And what God did in me more than anything is he just convicted me of my sinfulness. And he convicted me of his goodness and his perfection. And I can't measure up. He is so good. And man, that's not what the message is about today. But I couldn't help telling you a little bit. And I want to do this. I want to pray with you this morning that we will have our hearts open to receive whatever it is God wants to tell us. Would you be willing to pray that with me this morning? So would you bow with me today? And we're just going to pray this simple prayer. Pray it out loud if you want or silently if you'd like. God, if you have something to say to me today, I'm willing to listen. God, I pray that same prayer. Speak to me, to us. Through your word, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You might be wondering, why in the world are we studying world religions? Here's why. There is only one true path to Jesus, to heaven, and we want everyone to join us there someday. 
And so learning about other faiths is helpful to reaching people of other faiths. And many of us have coworkers, friends, neighbors, classmates who believe something different than us. And when you take the time to listen to them and understand where they're coming from, that's a huge step on the road to reaching them. And so last week we studied Islam. This week we study another religion. Our goal is to educate you. Our goal is to help you understand a little bit more of what they believe, to inspire and challenge you. And I hope today does that. Uh, to give you a little bit of a clue, I'm going to start with a quiz, and the quiz goes like this. What do George Bush, Eva Longoria, Larry King, and Selena Gomez all have in common? And if you said nothing, you're kind of right. Well, here's the deal. They all met someone who's considered to be the most famous leader of a Eastern religion. I'm going to show you his picture. Maybe it will jog who this is. Anyone know who this is? The Dalai Lama. That's his title, correct. 14th Dalai Lama. He leads a, a faction of what religion? Buddhists. Yes, Buddhists. Um, there are 500 million Buddhists in the world. And the Dalai Lama leads a faction of those Tibetan Buddhists. He's has outsized influence, he's um, well-known, he's, he's someone that celebrities love to meet and channel kind of his teachings and, and his focus. Um, Buddhism is now, it's one of the largest religions in the world, fascinating enough. Now when you think of Buddhism, maybe you picture a cross-legged chubby guy in a Chinese restaurant. Um, maybe you picture a orange-robed monk on a mountainside. I don't know what you picture, but what you may not realize is that they are pretty close to home. In fact, two weeks ago, I was uh, driving out to McDonough to pick up something that we had purchased um, on Facebook Marketplace and uh, passed this. This is a Buddhist temple right up the road in McDonough. Um, so I did what anyone would do. I stopped and tried to talk to someone. Um, no one was there, unfortunately. So I, I went up to the temple. There's their lovely statue. Um, I peeked in the window. I got a picture of what it looks like inside. And this, this temple really comes to life in the summer. A lot of Buddhists come up from New York City uh, to this particular temple. But they've bought up a lot of land in McDonough, and there's a lot of Buddhists who live in McDonough, not far from here. If you travel the highway, you've probably seen the other large um, temple or retreat center in Castle Creek, also Buddhist. And so these folks are near us. They're living near us. They're worshiping near us. They're searching for something right in our backyard. And the influence of Buddhism is actually quite pronounced. It might be through an a online influencer. It might be through a college professor. Buddhism has really um, saturated a lot of teaching in universities. Um, and even through your yoga instructor, there's Buddhist underpinnings to that yoga. And, and so Buddhism has a lot of um, influence that we don't often associate with Buddhism, but that's exactly what it is. So what a Buddhist family is doing, uh, they're just looking to find something in the midst of a crazy, chaotic, stressful life. And that thing they're looking for is peace. I mean, doesn't that sound good to us too? That's kind of the idea of yoga, just kind of centering yourself, finding that place of peace and of calm. It's very attractive. In a Buddhist home, they'll often have a little shrine set up um, where they'll have uh, pictures and symbols and images. They'll have written teachings from their Buddha, who we'll talk about. And uh, they don't worship these things. They just kind of revere them and try to find direction through them. Uh, what they'll typically do three times a day is they'll do prayer, meditative, contemplative, chanting prayer. Um, they'll sometimes visit a, a temple every day. Others not as often but definitely during holidays. When they go to a temple, a Buddhist temple, they'll give their best to a monk. Um, who kind of They kind of do the greeting with, with a bow and their hands together. You've seen that, I'm sure. And on holidays, when they get together and they're chanting uh, repetitively, it's, it's fairly deafening when they do that. Now, how did all of this begin? Let, let's go back in history. Last week, when we talked about Islam, we had to... Re rewind 1,500 years. Any idea how far we got to rewind to get back to the start of Buddhism? 
you need to go back an extra thousand years. 2,500 years ago is when it began. There was a lady who was experiencing a difficult pregnancy in childbirth. She died giving birth to a son. The son's name was Siddhartha Gautama, and he was a prince from Nepal. He was born into privilege and had a dad who had endured so much suffering and loss that he decided to shelter Siddhartha. I'm just going to call him Sid for short, okay? He decided that he was going to shelter Sid from the, the difficulties of life. So he gave Sid everything he could want. And Sid grew up in the palace, living a life of, of luxury and pleasure and indulgence. At 16 years of age, he was even given a wife and had a son of his own. His father kept him safe in the palace, and nothing was allowed to, to threaten his peaceful existence in the lap of luxury. But as he grew older, Sid began to realize that something wasn't normal about his life that everyone around him didn't seem to live like him, and he grew curious. And he just kind of wanted to understand his place in the world. So against his father's wishes, one day he got the chariot driver, and they snuck off for a little chariot ride outside the palace walls. And as the story goes, they were, they were along the road when he saw a very elderly man who was twisted and disabled from age. And Sid had never before seen suffering. And he was disturbed by what he saw. He cried out, stop, to his driver and just sat there and stared at this old man. And he was startled and troubled by what he saw. And he said to his driver, is this the fate of all people? And the driver replied, yes, all of us grow old. And that distress Sid. He didn't know what to do with that. So he went back to the palace and he was heart sick. He knew there was more to see and he had more questions without answers. So he planned another excursion. Unknown to him, his father confronted the driver and made sure that if Sid ever went out again, there would be no old people along his route. Don't ask me how he accomplished that, but he somehow did. So along the way, they're not passing any old people, only young people, but he noticed someone else, someone who was very sick, almost to the point of death. And so he yelled to his driver again, stop. And he just sat there from his chariot and looked at this sick person. And he, and he asked his driver, is this the fate of all people? And his driver simply said, yes. Yes, all people will suffer illness at some point in their lives. <laughs> he was really troubled now and went back to the safety of the palace, but couldn't stay there long, so he did a third expedition. Now his father had gone and talked to the driver and said, make sure if he ever goes out again that he doesn't come across any old people or sick people. And the driver complied. But Sid went for a long ride that day, and after going quite a distance, what was in front of him he didn't know what to do with, because there was a lifeless body laid out for a Hindu funeral. He had never seen a dead body before, and he, and he didn't even know what it was. He asked his driver, what is that? And the driver said, this is someone who has died. And Sid then asked, is this the fate of all people? And his driver replied, yes, one day all of us will experience death. Well, Sid was beside himself with despair. He got home, his dad saw his face and knew Sid was in trouble. So he decided to drown out his son's pleasure with a party. I mean, his pain with a party. And so he threw this big party and it didn't work. Sid couldn't get his mind off of what he had experienced, what he had seen and the heartache around him. And there was no answer that he had that could fix that. Why is there suffering? Why is no one able to do anything about it? So one night, while his wife and son were sleeping, he slipped away from the palace, never to return again. He knew his possessions and his pleasures were not the answer, so he decided he was going to take the opposite approach. He renounced his wealth, he renounced his position, and he sought answers in religion. For years, he lived as a Hindu monk. We'll learn about Hinduism Next week, Hinduism gave him a concept of God, but the God of Hinduism is not a God who's approachable or knowable. And so maybe being close to this religion could give him answers, he thought. So he did all the rituals, he did all the, relig all the, all the routines. And he came to a conclusion that if there's a God out there, he's no help at all. So 
He, he, he rejected religion, said that obviously isn't going to work. I've had everything, and that didn't work. I've had religion, and that didn't work. Now I'm going to go another route. And his other route was, I'm going to try with nothing. So he, he, he got rid of everything he had. He tried living with nothing. He, he even tried to eat nothing. He tried to survive on a grain of rice a day. How would that be for a diet? Grain of rice a day. In the end, he didn't find answers. He just found himself hungry. Very hungry. And finally, at age 35, he sat down under a tree, and he determined he was not going to get up until he found the answer for suffering. And so he sat there and meditated for 49 days. And finally, he fell into this deep trance. And in his dreams, he believed that he understood the source of suffering and the path to overcoming it. Not wealth and not poverty, he had tried both, but what he called a middle way. And he felt like the revelation he received under that tree after the 49th day made him enlightened. And so he called himself the enlightened one, which was translated Buddha. And he was known as the first Buddha. He spent the rest of his life traveling as a guru, teaching people how to have private meditation and get the peace that he was searching for. At age 80, Sid died of food poisoning. I don't know if it was a bad grain of rice, but here's his final words roughly translated. All things will continue to decay, so work out your own solution with care. How's that for a parting message of hope? He didn't leave a successor. He just challenged people to take his teachings and test them with their own experience. Sid didn't have an answer for everyone. He struggled to even find the answers for himself. And so kind of his solution to all of the suffering, all the pain in life was he had a series of beliefs and it was kind of this idea, give it your best shot. Give it your best shot. And since then, hundreds of millions of people, including half a billion today, are giving it their best shot, following the path of Buddhism. They're trying to make sense out of the difficulty of life. And their main focus is how to deal with suffering. That is the biggest problem for any faith or religion, is how do you handle suffering? That is the focus of Buddhism. What about suffering? What about pain? And so there's four truths that they have in the Buddhist faith that I want to just share with you that helps you understand a, a Buddhist philosophy, a Buddhist mindset. The first one is this, the reality of suffering. Buddhists believe that everyone suffers and experiences pain, heartbreak, sickness, and death. Some of you are like, no, duh. Okay, that's a big deal for them because here's why. Their goal is to find release from that. They believe this is a reality and that the goal of life is to find release from this. And they have a unique way to find that release. So the second noble truth is the cause of suffering. They actually think of suffering different from us. They think that our suffering is because we're attached to things. And if we just learned to not be attached to things, we wouldn't ever miss what we didn't have. Follow me? So if you don't grow attached to people or, or possessions or, or positions or things in life, if you just learn to detach yourself from those things, then when suffering happens and you lose those things, you'll be unaffected. You won't suffer. And so their idea is the cause of suffering is to, is to just kind of get out of that attachment, to break your attachment to things, center yourself do the whole yoga thing, just, just within yourself, break free of all these attachments around you. That's the philosophy. The, the idea that temporary things bring us desires and, and, and those desires lead to bad things is called karma. You've heard of that? And this idea of karma is this cause and effect. And you get trapped in the cycle of wanting and desiring things and losing things and it's good karma, bad karma, and it's a cycle that they call samsara, and it means birth, life, death, rebirth, and it's a loop, a loop, a loop. And we're caught in this cycle of good karma, bad karma, and samsara. 
Their third noble truth is the end of suffering. Now, this is fascinating. Does anyone else in this room wish they had an end of suffering one day? Do you have hope that you'll have an end of suffering one day? It is the 100% goal of every Buddhist to get here. And here is different than you're here of where you're hoping for hope. So here's the end of suffering to them. To end suffering is to detach from life, which is fully accomplished when you reach enlightenment, which they call, you ever heard of nirvana? Nirvana. Now, nirvana, don't be confused. In Hinduism, nirvana is to be absorbed into the one. Very different. We'll talk about that next week. But in Buddhism, nirvana is to have your existence extinguished. And the way they describe it is it's like snuffing out the, can, the flame on a candle. That is their ultimate hope, is that someday their existence will be snuffed out. And when that occurs, they will experience no more suffering because they will experience nothing anymore. They will finally have reached the point of enlightenment where they're unattached and they cease to exist. That is the greatest hope of a Buddhist. And they are taught that it will take a minimum of seven lifetimes to get there. Seven lifetimes. And that idea of reincarnation, and you begin again and again and again, kind of like Groundhog Day. And you're not sure what's going to happen at the end of each day. Maybe you're going to wake up and you're going to be a grasshopper in the next life. Oops. You don't know if you're going forward or going backwards. It's all based on this idea of karma and being locked in this idea of attachment and there's not really a lot of accountability there because you just get another do-over in the next life. And so it's very much, I hope in this life, to make progress towards this concept of nirvana being unattached and freed from all suffering. The fourth noble truth is the eightfold path to enlightenment. And this is very simply having right behaviors and attitudes. There's eight things that they, that they focus on here. Having right views, right resolves, right speech, right actions, right livelihoods, right efforts, and right mindfulness. Sounds exhausting. But it all depends on you. Like you've got to do these things. If you want to reach this plane of nirvana, you've got to do these eight things on a consistent basis. And so it's a tremendous, exhausting pursuit which kind of flies in the face of what you typically think with the Buddhists of kind of peace and calm and serenity. And meanwhile, they're working as hard as they can to achieve that thing that they can't achieve. And they very highly doubt they can achieve in this lifetime. What's interesting about a Buddhist is that you kind of figure this out if you convert to Buddhism or chase the path of Buddhism. You need to figure this out on your own. I mean, you may get help from a guide or a teacher or, or someone like the Dalai Lama, but even the Dalai Lama, do you know what percent of the Buddhists follow the Dalai Lama? I mean, you would think most of them, right? One half of one percent of Buddhists follow the Dalai Lama. I mean, that is how fractured they are. It's genuinely this idea that everyone needs to find their own path. And you find the path to nirvana. So what Buddhists are searching for is they're searching for a peace that satisfies. They're trying to find release from suffering. Now, at some level, their struggle is our struggle. It's the human struggle. All of us struggle with the suffering around us. When Sid left the palace and saw an older person struggling with age and saw a sick person struggling with disease and saw a dead person who is no longer struggling, they're just dead, he struggled with this concept of suffering. And how do you somehow rise above that? And spent the rest of his life trying to find it. And came to the conclusion that in the end, you can't stop it. You can't stop suffering. You can't change suffering. So your best hope is to not feel suffering. Your best hope is to somehow detach yourself from everything around you. And your best hope is that someday you'll be so detached that you'll cease to exist. How inspiring. How troubling and sad. Your best possible hope is to cease to exist. So just for a moment, think big picture here. Sid, or Siddhartha, tried everything he could to find inner peace. He had wealth. He had power. He was the prince of Nepal and didn't find it. So he tried religion. And in religion, he couldn't find it. So he tried poverty. 
And in poverty, he couldn't find what he was searching for. His journey is a lot like the journey of another guy who lived 400 years before him. 400 years before Siddhartha lived, there was another prince who was born into royalty, who had everything life could offer, and so he tried to experience purpose in life through wealth and pleasure and power, and it left him empty. So then he tried work and accomplishment, and it left it empty. And then he tried work and experience and knowledge and learning, and it left him empty. Anyone know the name of that prince? Solomon. In fact, in the Holy Bible, his journal is included. Ecclesiastes is the journal of a prince 400 years before Sid who tried all the same things Sid did and couldn't either find purpose to life. And interestingly enough, Solomon came to a very different conclusion as Sid. Solomon came to a conclusion that purpose cannot be found under the sun. And that's a phrase he repeats in his journal over and over. Under the sun, all is meaningless. Under the sun, all is hopeless. Under the sun. And he finally has to look above the sun to get to purpose. And he discovers God. And when Solomon reconnects with God, And a relationship and obedience to God, he discovers meaning and purpose. The purpose that Sid never was able to discover. So Buddhists are trying to fix and get out of the cycle of suffering. They're trying to end the cycle. And their hope is that one day, suffering will cease. Can I tell you? There is even better hope than that. Let me show you from the word of God what it says in Revelation 21. It says, look, God's home is now among his people. Remember Sid trying to, trying to connect with the Hindu God and there was no personal God. There was no knowable God. He wanted so badly to meet with God. But he had no frame of reference to know the true God like Solomon found. Here's a different kind of hope that Sid could have had. God's home's now among his people. God himself will be with them. <laughs> he will wipe every tear from their eyes. When you see tear, what do you think of? Suffering, sadness, disease, pain, death. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. There's some hope. There's the hope that every Buddhist person is seeking. They're just seeking it in the wrong way. They're looking at the wrong thing to give them this hope. The answer to our suffering, the answer to our problems is not a matter of mind over matter. I'll tell you, the last few weeks, I have an enormous issue with one of my back molars, and it's caused tremendous pain, and I've tried to ignore it. It's not working. So I've got a root canal scheduled for next Monday. And until then, ibuprofen is my best friend. But it's not working. I can't get out of my suffering by pretending it's not there. It wakes me up at night, reminding me, oh, I'm here. And I hurt. And so this idea, and I, and I don't mean to belittle a Buddhist person, it's, their suffering is real and genuine, and they so badly believe that they can escape it by pretending it's not there or by eliminating their attractions and connections and attachments so they no longer feel that suffering. It is a noble pursuit. It just has the wrong object of trust. They're trusting their own mind and their own ability to break out of that cycle rather than a God who broke out of that cycle for them. In fact, Jesus was similar to Sid, born in wealth and, and, and power. He wasn't born, as you know. He was the son of God with no beginning, but he was in the beauty of heaven. You think of nirvana, heaven's way better than nirvana, no suffering. And Jesus decided one day that he would come to our suffering. Kind of like Sid, right? He's going to go experience suffering. But Jesus came to suffering not to eliminate it. Jesus came to experience it on our behalf. Check this out from Philippians 2. He gave up his divine privileges. He left the the palace, the castle. He took the humble position of a slave. He was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. If only Sid could have met Jesus. Jesus is the personal God that Siddhartha never met. 
And Jesus didn't try to escape suffering. Jesus ran to suffering. He chose to suffer himself. Not to free us from suffering. But to give us the power and the example to live through it in hope that one day he'll conquer and end it. Some Buddhists actually believe that Jesus was a good teacher, that he lived a sacrificial life, and that he's going to help us reach nirvana. But here's the deal. Jesus was not reincarnated, was he? His life wasn't extinguished. They tried to snuff out the candle of his life. Guess what happened three days later? He came back to life. He rose again, and he offers eternal life. And along with eternal life, there's something else that Jesus offers that no one else can make a genuine offer and match. Here's what Jesus offers. This is so cool. John 14, 27. I am leaving you with a gift. Read this with me. Peace of mind and heart. What are Buddhists searching for? This. Jesus said, I am leaving this with you. I've left my throne. I've experienced your suffering. And now I have something for you. I am the God who is near to you. I am the God who suffers with you. No other God can claim that. I am leaving you peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Jesus is the solution of every Buddhist. Jesus is the answer to every Buddhist prayer. So how do we spread this word? Let me share with you just two stories of two Buddhist folks and their journey to seeking this peace. The first gentleman, his name is Bruce, and he grew up in a Buddhist community. He followed, um, he wanted greater status than his parents, and so he willingly became a monk, and he followed the rituals, and he started each day at 6 a.m. with prayer and chanting and meditation. He did the ritual washings. He memorized the sayings of Buddha. And later, here's what he wrote. He said, yes, for a while in the monastery, away from everyday problems, I felt at peace. After all, I didn't have to cope with reality. However, I didn't feel satisfied, nor was I taught how to cope with life outside the monastery. So he decided to look elsewhere for answers. Starving his desires, the teachings of Buddhism, it didn't erase his needs and he couldn't find inner peace. So he started researching other religions. And it was only when he encountered Jesus that he found the peace he was searching for. Here's the deal. Buddhists need to know people who have found Jesus. Because Jesus suffered to give us that peace, right? So if we can demonstrate true spiritual peace, we if we have Buddhist friends or acquaintances or neighbors, and if you don't, I hope someday you will, our hope, my hope, is that we will have the peace that they desire and they will see that in us. Now let me ask you, when life hits, when you experience suffering, the toothache, the lost job, the financial issues, the, the, the tension in a relationship, the kid issues, the car issues, fill in the blank issues. How do you respond? Do you respond with a peace that no one else can understand? Because as a Christian, that is exactly what Jesus offers you, is a peace that passes our understanding. And so if you are responding to the suffering of life with an incredible sense of peace, You are a billboard for Jesus to the people around you who can't find that peace because they can't find it in wealth or poverty or religion and you found it in Jesus. And so let suffering, let pain be a reminder to you that you have something that the world can't give and the world can't take away. His name is Jesus and he's the Prince of Peace. Now, let me tell you about another young Buddhist named Nak, N-O-K. She grew up a devoted follower of her family tradition of Buddhism. She meditated and prayed at home, and she went to temple regularly. And when she went to university, she met some Jesus followers, and she got to know them. And, and, and her goal in knowing them was simply to help her English get better. 
But they befriended her, and they shared their home and meals with her and her friends. And later, here's what she said. I was impressed by their love. Same as what we learned last week. I was impressed by their love. Her religion was one of works. And she saw her struggles as evidence that she hadn't arrived yet. And so she was constantly striving, working harder. And then she was introduced to these friends. And they introduced her to Jesus Christ. And her and her friends got to meet a personal God. And the Prince of Peace became her prince and leader. If you want to continue researching Buddhism, maybe you do have someone in your life who follows the ways of Buddha. Um, a book I'd like to recommend to you is this, Leaving Buddha, A Tibetan Monk's Encounter with the Living God. Just a, a great book that's the journey out of Buddhism and into a walk with Jesus. Here's what I want you to know too. Don't take this knowledge of the Four Noble Truths and the different things we've learned today and use it to enter into a debate or argument with someone. They don't tend to change minds. The only way to win a debate is do it on Facebook. <laughs> the better way, the better way is to show the peace of Jesus. And that's inarguable. To show and live the peace of Jesus. Nock gives this metaphor. She said, if I were sailing on a boat that tipped over in the ocean and started drowning, a Buddhist would offer me a how-to book on swimming. But Jesus would come over to me, give me his hand, and say, trust me. Let's be that hand of Jesus to the people around us who are drowning. They're looking for peace in all the wrong places. My friends, if you know Jesus, you found that peace. The peace the world can't give and the peace the world can't take away. I want to recommend another book for you to read. It's a big one, but it's a doozy. It's beautiful. Including here is the journal of the man 400 years before Sid, who couldn't find meaning and purpose. Ecclesiastes. Book of John. There's 66 different books in here, and all of them will draw you to one place, and his name is Jesus. Frankly, I don't want to talk more about Buddha today. I want to talk about Jesus, because he is what every Buddhist needs. He is what you and I need. My friends, I don't know about you, but Jesus is doing a work in me, and he is convicting me, He's softening me. He's growing me. And he's giving me a peace I can't get on my own. You know, Tucker, Tucker Carlson of Fox News was planning to go to a live show from Asbury University on Friday. And Asbury University reached out and told him, no, don't come with your cameras. And Tucker was stunned. He said, in my line of work, I meet people all the time, and they all want publicity. He said, the only people I meet that don't want publicity are people who are doing bad things. And occasionally, some people who are doing something really right. And he said, I don't know what's going on there in Wilmore, Kentucky. I just think that what they're doing must be something really right. And I respect them so much more that they didn't want my cameras there. My friends, people are watching you. Do they see Jesus? We don't have a lot of time to waste. Right? If you believe that eternity is real, if you believe that life is but a breath, but a vapor, we don't have a lot of time. And the day to get right with God is not tomorrow. Because tomorrow is never going to get here. If God is pressing on your life to get right with him, why not today? Why not today? Why not get right with him today? I'm telling you, some of you are, 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 are Christians, you're church people and all that, and, 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 and me too, that's an awesome thing, but are you right with God? Is there anything in your life that you say, I'm just 
<laughs> I'm, I'm ashamed of or I know God's displeased with. So why are you holding on to that thing? I couldn't enter into worship last week with those people at Asbury. I couldn't until I confessed some sin to God. Until the divine finger came off my chest. God wants your whole heart. He's not satisfied getting some of it. He wants all of you. Does he have it? Does he have all your heart? You don't have to answer that out loud. You've got to answer it to him. Does he have all of you? Some of you, you're control freaks. Like, I, I, I can't give up everything. I can't surrender control. That's terrifying. Okay, so let me ask you, how's it working out for you? And I don't ask that in a judgmental way. I ask that as a fellow control freak. It doesn't work to run our own lives. It doesn't work to manage our own sin. We only find the love and peace of Jesus when we let him in and let him take control. And that's terrifying. So it's all about trust. Do you trust that God's better than you? Do you trust that you need him desperately? If you do, then maybe today is a day of surrender. Because see, I don't think we're going to reach any Buddhist friends until Jesus reaches us first. Until we have the peace that they're searching for. It's not enough to just say, I'm Christian, I go to church. Do you have peace? Genuinely, do you have peace? in the midst of your suffering and your struggle? Because if the answer is not 100% no, then you don't fully have Jesus. Or let me put it another way, Jesus doesn't fully have you. And he wants you. He wants you desperately. He gave up his life for you. He loves you with all of his heart. He left the pleasures of heaven to experience the suffering of earth. Why? For you. When he died, your name was on his mind. You can't escape the goodness or the love or the mercy of Jesus, no matter how far you go or how hard you try. He is relentless in his pursuit of you. And maybe today, maybe today, you'll stop running. And you'll let him give you the forgiveness that you need. Would you bow with me this morning? My friend, in a few minutes, we're going we're gonna to close with a song. It's a song titled Graves into Gardens, and it's beautiful. It's beautiful. We selected this song because of the parallel to Buddhism. And here's how this song goes. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. And then the chorus goes like this. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Another verse says this. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness. Some of you right now, you're battling with God. I don't know why it's so hard for us to admit our failures and our sins to God. He sees and knows them already. He's not surprised. He's not shocked. He won't somehow turn away from us or love us less. He's waiting like a father, lovingly waiting for his kid to come home. He says, I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, Lord. You've seen them all. And you still call me friend because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again father I pray this morning that as we sing this song that we won't just sing empty words but we will sing from the bottom of hearts grateful for you God I look across the land and I see so much suffering and sin and we've wandered so far from you God, right now in our midst, there's an awakening of people who are getting hungry for you. God, would you spread that hunger to us? 
May, may we become desperately hungry for a God who satisfies. Would you give us the freedom today to confess whatever the sin is that, that we need to confess, to make it right with someone that we've wronged, to reconcile a relationship that has become estranged. God, would you forgive us for the time we've wasted? And would you lead us back to the Prince of Peace? Thank you for showing yourself to us in Jesus. May we search for him with all of our heart. And may we find him. In Jesus' name, amen.